Welcome to lesson number five, What is the Church in the Membership Matters series. We have spent four lessons now studying what is the gospel, and we have learned that the gospel is the message uh, of God, from God, about God, and to the glory of God. It tells us who God is, it tells us who we are, and it tells us then our need for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, and who Jesus is. And the commands of the gospel are to repent, to have a changed heart and mind, to turn away from our sin, and to trust Christ, to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. And it's a gospel then that gives birth to uh, the church, the community uh, that has by grace through faith believed in the gospel. And so the gospel is kind of the root and the church is the fruit. And so now we turn our attention to what is this thing uh, called the church. Books and books have been written, written about the church and what it is. So I want to try to keep it really, really simple. If you'll look at your outline, this is lesson five, what is the church? And I have just a few simple statements that I want us to think about uh, that define biblically what a church is. And so number one, the church is in its very essence, the people of God. So if I ask you to write down um, 10 things that you think you have to have to have a church, it would be interesting to see those, those uh, lists and to get them all together and to see what your answers are. But I hope at least you would include the people of God. It has to be, at, at bare minimum, the people that God has saved and chosen for Himself and redeemed. Again, it is the gospel that is the power of God into salvation to everyone who believes, and therefore the gospel is the root that, that brings forth, that gives birth uh, to this regenerate community, this born-again community, believers in God through His Son, Jesus Christ. And so the first truth, the church is the people of God. The New Testament church is, like most concepts in the New Testament, grounded in the Old Testament concepts uh, of the people of God, or the assembly. The Hebrew word is the kahal. And so let me give you a, a scripture for that. In the Old Covenant, the Israel, the chosen people of God, they were called the assembly quite frequently. And you see that especially in Deuteronomy. An example, Deuteronomy 31, verse 12. God says through Moses, Assemble the people, men, women, and little ones, and the sojourner within your towns, that they may hear and learn to fear the Lord your God, and be careful to do all the words of this law, and that their children who have not known it may hear and learn to fear the Lord your God, as long as you live in the land that you are going over to possess. And so that concept in the Old Covenant, the kahal, the assembled people of God, men, women, boys and girls, then kind of gives root to the ekklesia, the Greek word for church in the New Testament. And that word, ekklesia, means literally the called out ones, but it was used almost entirely of a called out people who were called to assemble. So it really can be translated an assembly of people or assembly call of called people. And so that word in and of itself is a beautiful word that God gives us to describe what He does to form this people for Himself. He calls us out of our sin. He calls us out of the world and He calls us unto Himself. And He expects us then as the ecclesia to assemble, to be the assembled people of God. And that is in essence what the church is. The church is first and foremost a people of God saved by grace through faith in Jesus Christ. And it is universal in its nature. And so the church could in a universal sense be considered the redeemed people of God down through all human history in every age and in every generation. But of course, we can't assemble, we can't uh, follow the commands of the New Testament universally. I can't, whether I like it or not, I can't meet with the saints who have gone on before me and are already in glory. I, I can't meet with literally and fulfill the covenantal commitments of the New Testament with the churches in Africa. I might be able to enjoy some fellowship with them online, but I can't literally fulfill uh, the purpose of the church uh, in a universal sense. We are very localized. And so I want to 
say that the church is universal in nature, but it is distinctly local in its expression. In its expression, there's no other way for us to actually obey the commands given to the church except to gather um, life on life, face to face, uh, locally. And so the church is an assembly that comes together locally to covenant together with God and one another. And that's the second truth on your outline. The church is the people of God. That's number one. And then number two, the church in its essence is a covenantal community. We are in covenant with God. That is by saving grace alone through faith alone in Jesus Christ. But God in Christ has united us to himself and we are now in a vertical covenant with the Lord Jesus Christ. By default then, everyone who is in Christ or united to God by faith in Christ is also in a horizontal relationship with one another. This is why the Bible uses family language and organic language to describe the church. The church is a covenantal community in covenant with God and then by default again in covenant with one another. The vertical has to come first. The vertical always drives the horizontal but we cannot get around the horizontal. We are called by God to gather together and do covenantal life together in this community that he calls the church, the called out assembly of God. We have obligations to one another, the New Testament says. We have relationships with one another. And if you just look at the word in the New Testament, one another, uh, I preached a series several years ago on the one another's in the New Testament, prefer one another, pray for one another, be hospitable to one another, uh, forgive one another. All of these require us to be in a covenantal relationship with one another. We have commitments to one another as believers in the Lord Jesus Christ. The way the church is described in the New Testament lets us know a lot about the expectations of God uh, for His redeemed people in Christ. We're universal in nature, but local in expression. And you see that through these organic labels at the bottom of your outline. I've listed uh, several of those. And if you were in class with me, I would ask you to choose your favorite one and then tell the class a little bit about why that label for the church Uh, is your favorite label. So let me just go through a few of those at the bottom of your outline. The church is said to be a family. This is really important in our culture and in our society because families are so broken and so uh, destroyed, quite frankly. Uh, The enemy's attacks have been aimed at the foundation of all human society and it's also the foundation of the church, the family. Churches can only be as strong as their families. And so it is a sweet thing that Jesus called us brothers, sisters, mothers. He calls us His family, and He calls us to live together as a covenantal family. The church is a body of Christ. And think of that organic label. We'll say more about that in a future session. But 1 Corinthians 12 in particular talks about the church as a functioning body with Christ as its head, and then we are the body being nourished by the head. Uh, Adrian Rogers, a famous Baptist preacher from yesteryear, used to say, anything without a head is dead, and anything with two heads is a freak. So we want to have one head, the Lord Jesus Christ, and be nourished so that we're growing as a healthy body. We all need each other. And again, we'll say more about this in a future session. The church is called a fellowship, the Greek word koinonia. It it is more of a military term than we often like to think of today. We think of it as uh, fried chicken and food is certainly part of good fellowship. I'm uh, I'm not against food. I'm very much pro-food. But fellowship in the biblical sense is, is like a soldier standing shoulder to shoulder with his buddy in the trenches while the bullets fly that we are We are going to the mat for one another. We will stick with one another and we will uh, uphold one another in this great spiritual battle for souls that the church is called into um, as the redeemed family of God in Christ. We are a fellowship committed to one another. 
The church is called a community in Acts 2.44. We get our word community from these, these words that are in our Bible. Community uh, means we are living, doing life together. We are embracing one another, sharing our meals together, worshiping together, and that we come together uh, in unity around our common faith and our common salvation. The church is called God's temple. The temple was the place where God's literal presence dwelt with his people in the old covenant. What a picture that Jesus says uh, in John's gospel chapter two, that he is the new covenant temple. And he said, destroy this temple and I'll raise it again in three days. And John tells us he was speaking of his body. And then later on, the New Testament begins to speak about the church as the temple of God, the literal dwelling place of God through the Holy Spirit given to us uh, who believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. And so we are where God dwells. That's true individually, but we have a, a strong tendency as Americans to over-individualize the truths of the Bible and we, we try to make it a faith that is just, hey, it's just Jesus and me. Uh, and that is not the, the point the Bible is making, the New Testament's making when it calls us a family and a body and a fellowship and a community and God's temple. We corporately are where God is pleased to dwell on earth now. His presence is particularly powerful among us when we gather, when we assemble and do what we are literally called to do as the church, the called out assembly of God. The church is also, you'll see on your outline, uh, point F at the bottom of your page, it's called the Bride of Christ. Now this one is particularly special to me because I happen to have a bride and I think she's the greatest woman on planet earth. And so it's very um, relatable to me that Christ calls all of his people that he died to save his bride. Um, he lays his life down for his bride. He always does what is best for his bride. He nourishes and cherishes his bride. He washes his bride with the water of the word. And we could go on and on. He will one day present, Ephesians 5 says, his bride to himself spotless and without wrinkle. What a beautiful love God has bestowed upon us in His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, to make us His bride. The end of the Bible, right? Revelation 22 says, the angel says to John, Come, behold the bride made ready uh, for the marriage supper of the Lamb. What a beautiful picture of the church. The church is also called branches. Jesus is the vine, John 15, and we are the branches, so He is our life. And we then uh, have our source of life and health and strength in Him. But we're all branches from the same vine, uh, related in that way. The church uh, is said to be sheep. Jesus said He's the good shepherd in John 10, and He lays down His life for the sheep. You see how organic these labels are. Uh, they're agricultural and just kind of life relational type words and pictures and language that Jesus uses and the apostles use in the New Testament to tell us what it means to be a church or the church. We're sheep under the tutelage of the chief shepherd, the great shepherd, the Lord Jesus Christ. And he entrusts the church, as we'll see in a future session, to under shepherds that we call pastors. The church is also said to be salt and light. We give flavor, if you will, to the world as we evangelize and love as Jesus loved. And light is a source of life. It is a source of guidance, a source of wisdom. God's life and wisdom flow through His people as they proclaim the gospel and live it out amongst the lost and dying world. And we are loyal subjects of the King. We are citizens of the kingdom of the Lord Jesus Christ. All of these labels and more tell us a whole lot. They paint pictures for us, don't they? Of what it means to be a church, the people of God called out by God, by grace through faith in Christ to assemble in covenant with God and one another. This is the essence of the church. If you turn to the second page or the back page of your outline, I want you to see this quote by Millard Erickson. 
And I want you to think about the concept of an unconnected church member. And I assure you that that concept is simply not in the New Testament. There is no such thing in the New Testament as a believer who is not connected to the body of Christ and who is not in fellowship and not a part of the family and not actively engaged uh, with the kingdom and the citizens being salt and light together. And my point in this is, is to again reinforce that we are a committed community, committed to Christ and one another. We gather and we do what Christ has called us to do, uh, love Him and obey Him together. We hold one another accountable before God and one another. As Ephesians 4, 1 says, to walk in a manner worthy of the calling that we have in Christ Jesus. The quote by Millard Erickson, I point your attention to it, and I just want to read it to you and you follow along. While acknowledging the distinction between the visible or empirical church and the invisible or spiritual fellowship, we should do whatever we can to make the two identical. Just as no true believer should be outside the fellowship, so also there should be diligence to assure that only true believers are within. The Bible argues for a careful monitoring by the group of the spiritual condition and conduct of the members. While perfect purity of the membership is an ideal that cannot be realized within this life, open unbelief and sin are not to be tolerated, end quote. I think Brother Erickson nailed it, and he really helped us understand why it's so important to live as a covenantal community of God called unto Christ and one another. Point number three on your outline, I'll be brief here. Um, but the church has a purpose and a mission, singular purpose, singular mission. I love simplicity. When I was in the Marine Corps, uh, we had an acronym KISS, K-I-S-S, keep it simple, stupid. That doesn't sound very kind, but it was helpful <laughs> to us to remember to don't, don't give people 40 things to do uh, on their list. Uh, nobody can possibly juggle that many balls and keep them in the air all at once no matter how much you think you are a multitasker. And Jesus has been so kind to His church to give us one purpose and one mission. Purpose answers why we are here on this earth. Why the church? God is clear. His people have always existed for one purpose, His glory. He loves and delights in being glorified and exalted and praised and worshiped in and through His people that He redeems by His love and His grace and His mercy in Christ Jesus our Lord. And so we have a purpose to glorify God. We cannot get confused on why we're here. Everything we do as a church must be directed towards the glory of God in Christ alone. At CBC, we say that our purpose is this, to be consumed by the glory of God and the gospel of Christ. To be consumed by the glory of God and the gospel of Jesus Christ. We shorten that sometimes to help you remember it. CBC, Court and Baptist Church, consumed by Christ. That's our purpose. The mission that Christ gave the church is in the Great Commission of Matthew chapter 28. And that text has actually only one command in it, and the command is to make disciples. Will you turn with me to Matthew 28, and we will look at the mission of the church. Again, Christ gave us only one mission. And so we want to have tunnel vision here at Cordon Baptist Church and keep our eye on the singular purpose to glorify God and the singular mission to do so by making disciples. In Matthew 28, Verse 18, it says, And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always, even unto the end of the age. The one command in that text in the Greek is to make disciples. 
And it looks like the command is to go and make disciples, but literally it's just kind of after you go or having gone. So the point that God is making, Jesus is making there to his disciples is that the church exists to just make disciples wherever we are, wherever we go, and to go on purpose, whether it's to school or to your workplace or in your homes or in the shopping malls, as we go, as we live, we are on mission with God in Christ to make disciples, to, to share the gospel with them so that they can be saved, repent and believe and be born again. And when they do that, we baptize them. And then we begin to teach them all that Jesus has commanded us in the scriptures. So one purpose to glorify God, one mission to make disciples. And the way we put that all together here at Cordon Baptist Church is to say, we want to be a Christian family of disciple-making disciples who are consumed by the glory of God and the gospel of Jesus Christ. A Christian family of disciple-making disciples. If you're interested in that, you've come to the right place. Being discipled and learning to make disciples who will then go make more disciples, who will then go make more disciples until Jesus comes again. This is the purpose, the mission of the church. Scripturally, and Cordon Baptist Church has just tried to mimic that with our own language, to be consumed by Christ as we make disciples who make disciples. At the very bottom of your outline, you see my summary of what the church is. Let me just point your attention to it. It's in all caps and bold. The church is the people of God saved by grace through faith in Christ who live in a covenant community committed to obeying Christ and spreading His message. That is what a church is. May God help Cordon Baptist Church live up to His definition of what it means to be a church.